With Fantastic Beasts, The Crimes of Grindelwald coming out next month, it seemed like the perfect time to review all of the Wizarding World films. We're in week two, and that means we're talking about Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. So let's talk about it. Before I get started talking about my opinion on the film, be sure to tell me your thoughts down below in the comment section. And if you have read the books, and I know a lot of you have, tell me the specific things that are different between this movie and the book. I haven't read the books, and so I'm just kind of curious about what changes have been made in the films. Also, if you're someone that likes to talk about movies probably a little bit too much, you're probably in the right place, so consider clicking that subscribe button. So when it comes to Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, this movie is my introduction to Harry Potter. I, since I hadn't read the books, I didn't see the first movie, and then I went with a girl to go see this film in the theater. A little bit confused because I hadn't seen anything else, and it kind of jumps straight into the wizarding world, and so for me, this kind of has a lot of Harry, uh, Harry Potter nostalgia for me, since it is that starting point of my knowledge of this cultural phenomena that's taken over the last 20 years. In the past, if you've seen my rankings, I've actually ranked this one at the bottom before, and so I've been pretty negative on it, but re-watching it, it actually held up a lot better than I thought, which it was funny to me that I had this one at the bottom because it's the one that I have the nostalgia for, but uh, yeah, re-watching it this past week, I, I, there was a lot more that I appreciated watching it this time than when I had watched it previously in the past. So with that said, let's get started talking about the good. And I think the thing that just absolutely stood out to me watching the first two movies kind of back to back is how much the actual story of this movie is told versus in Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone or Sorcerer's Stone. If you read, watched my review from the previous week, I felt that the first film is a movie that does world building great, but has a very bad story. At least, I don't know if it's much better in the book, but in the film, it's very confusing. It just feels like suddenly we're into a third act after this movie that just kind of explores this world. And that's very different in this film, where it feels like you show up and right from the get-go, as soon as we get to Hogwarts, it establishes a mystery. Where's the Chamber of Secrets? What's this Chamber of Secrets? It establishes the threat and people are being petrified. And so there's this conflict and mystery that we're trying to resolve throughout the film. All along the way, there's new conflicts. We're learning more things about the world. Great kind of good storytelling and much improved as compared to the first film. It even leads up to a third act that feels much more cinematic than the previous film where you got gigantic snakes, there's plot twists, reveals, we get to know Voldemort quite a bit more in his backstory. And then even in our epilogue for the story and the resolution to things, there's some nice little moments where even some side kind of villainy characters like our Malfoy kind of gets, uh, uh, Harry Potter gets to defeat him by outthinking him and doing this clever thing with Dobby. And so it's just on a story level, on a storytelling level, very much improved over the previous film. Likewise, I think the special effects hold up a lot better. Now, they're not like amazing, like, wow, go back and watch this movie for the amazing special effects. But as compared to the first movie, where it felt like they really kind of tried to do some things that they couldn't do quite yet in that film. And I didn't feel that here. It feels like a 15, 16 year old movie. Some of it is a little bit dated, but it doesn't pull you out of the movie the way that Sorcerer's Stone has some shots that are not good and they really pull you out of the film. Another thing about this movie that just kind of stuck out to me that I thought it just always sticks out to me is that it adds three of kind of the best side characters in this whole franchise for me. So you got right out of the gate, we get Dobby very early and he he's a, a very funny, quirky, weird character that steals every scene that he's in in all the movies that he's in. And then we also meet Papa Malfoy and Jason Isaacs and another just super wonderfully, uh, a character you love to hate. And he's so good at playing those characters. And once again, we see that here. And it also helps us understand how son Malfoy, why he is, such a horrible person, where's that coming from? And so just a real nice touch, great, I mean, like much of this franchise, 
great cast casting here. Uh, the perfect guy to play that character. And then we move on to one more kind of brilliant pieces of casting and great characters in Lockhart. And it's hard to think of anyone besides Kenneth Branagh playing this character. I mean, it's he's just so good at playing this type of pompous, ridiculous character. Uh, the funny parts, the self-boasting parts, all of it does it so well. From there, let's move on to the negatives on this film. And the big thing is that this movie is way too long. So if you look at the links of the books, I think this is the second shortest. I think the first one is the shortest of them. And then this movie is the longest of the movies. It's two hours and 40 minutes long which is really long for a movie that's kind of targeting this age range. And I think I what I'm guessing kind of happened is there the book was just at that length where they could try to translate it very directly to the screen, much more so than when you've got an 800 page book as some of the later books kind of expanded to. And when you do that, you put too much in. And so watching through the movie, once again, just like the first film, it takes 30, 40 minutes to get to Hogwarts and for the story to kick in. And that worked in the first movie because we're being introduced to this world and who is Harry Potter, who's his terrible family, and what's this train station, and then how are we getting there? And we're learning everything about this world and how you get things. And so it had to teach us a bunch of things. That's why the beginning of that movie was so long. This movie, it just, you know, we're going to the Weasleys and then we got to meet Malfoy and we're hanging out with Dobby. We're on a train, we're not on the train, we're on the car floor, doing so many different things. And then finally we get to Hogwarts and we can kick into this story about the Chamber of Secrets. And that that's really the thing for this movie that just makes it feel bloated. It feels like uh, it meanders at times, even though in a lot of ways it's, it's a lot more focused than the previous film. But because there's just so much in there and everything is stretched out, it goes on forever. Another thing on this one is the the tone and the it, or the darkness. It's it's a heavier film than the first film. And I guess the, I, my wife has to, repeatedly told me, about, even once again today, told me about how the books are written. So they're written for the age range of the characters, of our lead characters in it. So the first one's for 11 year olds, and then the second one's for 12 year olds. And elements of this are that, very clearly, this is a story written for a specific age range. And then there's a lot of really heavy stuff in it where you're you know, talking about slavery, you're talking about you know, blood being written on the wall, petrified children, um, Hagrid being in prison based off of allegations. And then be even though he did things in the past, they're allowing him to work at the school with children but then there's a new threat and so they think we need to take some weird stuff in there. But there's a whole bunch of things that kind of go down that seems like the darkness level kind of went up a little bit too high, especially as we're trying to kind of introduce our kids. They're super interested. And then there's a lot more scenes in this one where we're like, whoa, there's pretty big jump in the scary, heavy stuff in this one. Like when you've got a central plot line about a dead little girl haunting a bathroom, that's really, that's pretty heavy stuff. But anyway, for the most part, this movie, if they'd edited it down, if they'd trimmed off 20 minutes off the movie, maybe even 30 minutes off the movie, and just had this very tight story about the Chamber of Secrets, this one pretty easily would have been better than the first film. But because it's overly long, I'm not quite sure at this point in time, but I very much appreciated that this is a much better structured story with a clear antagonist mystery that's resolved. The different pieces kind of fit together, even with our moaning Myrtle. It all ties together and answers questions how our main characters all tie into it. All that's really good. So overall, I'm going to score this once again a B and a 7 out of 10. If you like this review, be sure to check out that playlist right over there of my other reviews in this series. If you're watching this right when I posted, there's really just two videos in it. But by the end of this, there will be all the films. Thank you so much for watching and keep talking movies too much.